On February 11, 1990, around 10 p.m., the streets outside a Beaverton, Oregon apartment building seemed to be deserted. Upstairs, 17-year-old Elizabeth Barman was home alone in the first apartment she'd ever lived in on her own. In an apartment just downstairs, Terry McKemmy was going to bed. Next door, Terry Banks and her five-year-old daughter were watching television. As soon as I put my head back, I just started screaming, just help. She was screaming really loud, I mean, way loud, just so loud that you knew something was wrong. The minute I knew it was upstairs, I just got up and I went outside the back porch to see what was going on. My husband is kind of hard of hearing, so he had uh, his TV up pretty loud and for me to hear mine, I had to turn mine up very loud. And uh, I heard some banging noises, and I thought it was a party going on. I looked up, and I couldn't see over a porch. I just moved in like a week before that, so I, I didn't know any of the neighbors. I didn't know who was up there. I knew it was a girl, but I didn't know if there was guys. The unanswered questions were killing me. Yeah, sure, she's hurt. Sure, she's screaming. But the questions that I didn't know were the scariest. I don't know what's behind the door. I don't know how many people. I don't know if this goes on all the time. Somebody! I was just standing right there, waiting for anybody to open the door. And I would have been a part of whatever nightmare she was living. After it continued for a while, I figured she was just hanging up some pictures. 911 fire medical or police? Uh, police. What's the address? Okay. At 10.18 p.m., Bob Medak took a call. Department. All right, it's upstairs. I'm at 15, so it's upstairs twice. She's screaming. I can't get in. The door's locked. She says she can't get to the door. She's screaming. Help, help, all that kind of... Female screaming. Right now, it's going on. It's been going on for like five minutes. I don't know the neighbors. I don't know them. Okay. Okay, the name of the apartment The caller again. was very, very upset. He was frustrated that he couldn't help her. Now, I mean, okay. way loud. He was the information out very quickly and was wanting us there as fast as we could be. So he was very frustrated, as we feel sometimes. Okay, like, you know, like, I just went outside, she's just screaming, I don't know. So no one else is doing nothing. So then I went upstairs, she's screaming, the door's locked, you can't get in. I can't read, you know, I don't know what's going on. Okay, we'll get somebody up there. That's okay, great. I can just hear screaming okay, like, sir? I was yeah, panicked. Talked to the opera. I didn't know how much longer this girl was going to scream. I knew this is something serious. Police officer Mark Clark headed to the scene. All the dispatcher could tell us was that there was a woman screaming for help. I thought it's a family beef going on. Obviously violent. Get there now. Officer Clark arrived almost immediately. When I pulled into the parking lot, I could hear the screaming and the banging, and I had no idea if anybody was getting beat. I didn't know if while she's screaming, she's getting, you know, getting her head beat against the wall. My first thought is that I had to get in there. When I went up the stairwell, as I'm looking around, uh, of course I can hear these sounds, so I'm trying to keep myself quiet, keep my radio down, so that whatever's going on in there, they don't know I'm there. Help! Help 
thinking, got to have my backup here. Step it up here. You're not going to do anybody any good if you go in this place alone and you become incapacitated. tension is incredible because you want to get in there and if you're by yourself that just increases it tenfold the second officer jerry winter arrived less than two minutes later as neighbor terry mckemmy waited below when i saw the police officers i was like great this is great someone is here to help police officers open up Open the door, we're coming in. Kick it, Jerry. Where is he? When I kicked the door, I went off to the left. And Officer Clark came in low and went in basically straight ahead. My first thought running through my mind after we kicked the door was it's time to do battle with whatever is going on back here. Right in front of us is this sofa sleeper or hide a bed on end with one leg kind of dangling out of it. Elizabeth was pinned by the 200 pound piece of furniture. She was stuck. <laughs> I've never heard of a sofa attacking somebody like that, but when they're standing on end like that, I guess they can get pretty violent. <laughs> The situation itself, it must have been hilarious. The cops come in and they see part of a leg sticking out. I'm sticking my face in the crack, going, help me, help me, help me, you know, and I mean, it must have looked ridiculous. Are you hurt? <laughs> yes! Mr. Ward, you... I think we'd better get some firemen here to, if it turns out we need to cut this thing apart to get her out of there. We have a female subject who's trapped by a height of bed. I just had to convince them that they didn't need to call the paramedics and have a fire truck and a thousand people there, you know. And they finally just said, oh, okay, and they helped me out. But then I started to laugh because it was, the, the whole thing was so stupid. After we'd been through all the emotions that you go through on calls like this, um, kicking the door and finding out that it's a young lady who was trapped in her hide bed you almost feel like just throwing your arms up and turning around and walking away and covering your name tag so nobody knew you were there. You know? <laughs> I think one of the things I've learned is uh, don't go on any calls with Officer Clark. <laughs> he gets you into trouble. <laughs> I don't think it's funny. I don't think it's funny at all. I laugh because my friends make jokes. But uh, I don't think it's funny because I lived it. I lived the nightmare of going up, of not knowing, of all the unanswered questions.